Morning, everyone. The uh, committee will come to order. At the conclusion of opening statements yesterday, the chair called up H.R. 452, Medicare Decisions Accountability Act of 2011, and the bill was opened for amendment at any point. So the chair at this point will recognize himself to offer an amendment, and the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 452 offered by Mr. Upton of Michigan. And without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with, and I recognize myself for five minutes in support of the amendment. Uh, this is a pretty simple amendment. Uh, in addition to creating the board, IPAB established rules governing congressional consideration of the board's recommendations. These IPAB rules are among the statutory legislative procedures that were incorporated into the rules of the House. Section D of IPAB, which established the rules governing congressional consideration of the board's recommendations, also prohibits Congress from amending them. So that blocks the House from considering any legislation that changes how Congress considers recommendations from the board. Because subsection D amends congressional procedure, it is the jurisdiction of the Rules Committee. Therefore, this amendment accepts subsection D from the IPAB repeal. The result will be that IPAB is repealed, but section, subsection D alone will remain in the U.S. Code. Is there further discussion of the amendment? If not, the vote occurs on the amendment. All those in favor will say aye. Aye. All those opposed will say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Are there further amendments to this bill? Gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, is recognized. I don't have an letter. amendment, uh, but I do want to ask unanimous consent that a letter be inserted in the record from the um, Secretary of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius, and uh, uh, some other documents on this, uh, expressing opinions on this bill from the AFL. CIO, the uh, National Coalition on Healthcare, the American Federation of State County Municipal Employees, and an article um, by Nancy Ann uh, Mendeparo uh, on, on this very subject. Without objection, the, the documents are uh, put into the record. Are there, uh, gentlemen, yields back his time? The gentleman yields back. Are there further amendments to the bill? Seeing none, the, vote, the question now occurs on favorably reporting the bill as amended to the House. All those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed will say no. No. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. And roll call. Is it a roll call request? Do you want to? The, the, the ayes have it, and the, uh, the bill is passed. Bill, the chair now calls up H.R. 3309 and asks the clerk to report. H.R. 3309, as amended by the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology on November 16, 2011. Without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with... So ordered, are there any bipartisan amendments to the bill? Gentleman from Illinois, for what purpose does a gentleman from Illinois seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Gentleman has an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the title of the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 3309 as amended, offered by Mr. Kinzinger of Illinois. The uh, clerk will distribute the amendment, and the, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman from Illinois is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to thank Chairman Walden, uh, first off, for his continued efforts in bringing the FCC process reform legislation, uh, which he and I introduced to a markup. I feel it's, vitally, it's a vitally important piece of legislation which will improve the predictability, efficiency, and transparency of the FCC. 
Since the start of these hearings, I have continually stated my belief that many agencies, including the FCC at times, often come up with solutions in search of problems. In the case of the FCC, they sometimes do so without following a standard set of procedures, statutory law, or regulatory guidelines. That being said, I commend Chairman Jankowski. Chairman will suspend, ask for order in the committee. Go ahead. Thank you. That being said, I commend Chairman Jankowski for many of his great efforts towards streamlining some of these processes. But the fact of the matter is that many of these advances have been done at the chairman's discretion and are not, in fact, set in law. It's for this reason that I'm offering this bipartisan amendment today. My amendment simply states that the FCC must complete all actions necessary to submit to the Federal Register any amendment, any ad amended or adopted rule within 45 days of its adoption. This deadline does not necessarily mean that such an order would become effective in that amount of time, but it's a reasonable period of time for the Commission to submit such a document and allows for proper oversight of such decisions to take place. I believe this amendment to be an example of good government, which will put into law what Chairman Jankowski has been able to accomplish for some time now, as it's my understanding that the average length of time for these publications currently stands at just over 37 days. Again, my amendment will simply require the FCC to complete all actions necessary for such a document to be published in the Federal Register, and I ask for its inclusion into the bill, and I yield back. Will the gentleman yield to me? Sure. I uh, thank you for yielding to me. Uh, this is an amendment that we can agree on. It has been offered as a bipartisan amendment, and I would urge our colleagues to uh, vote for the amendment. Thank you. The gentleman yields back his time. Is there further debate on the uh, on the amendment? If not, the vote occurs on the amendment. All those will, in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed will say no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Uh, chairman, gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman. Mr. Chairman, I have a bipartisan amendment at the desk. It's labeled EJS 23. Clerk will report the title of the amendment. E Number 23? Yes. Okay. Amendment to H.R. 3309 as amended, offered by Mr. Waxman of California. The amendment will be considered as read, and the, general, the, the staff will distribute the amendment, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes in support of the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The amendment would require the FCC in evaluating and processing consumer complaints to present information about such complaints in a publicly available and searchable database on its website. The database would include information on the topics of the complaints and the parties complained of. The FCC would retain the flexibility to exclude duplicative complaints regarding the same alleged misconduct. H.R. 3309 is loaded with requirements that the FCC consider certain factors before adopting a rule. Most of these factors approach things from a business-oriented perspective. I think we should make sure the Commission is also required to consider consumer issues as seriously as it does the interests of business. The amendment would help move this bill towards that goal. The purpose of this amendment is to provide the public with access to information about complaints being processed at the FCC. Currently, the FCC makes available only aggregated data regarding consumer complaints, which is not in a format that can be readily used and sorted by the public. This amendment would ensure that consumer complaint information will be readily accessible to the public and provide important information on the topics of the complaints and names of the parties complained of. Uh, it would also provide the, the, um, the FCC greater discretion in how it would be framed. I offered and withdrew this amendment during consideration in the subcommittee based on the understanding that our staffs would work together and reach bipartisan agreement on this measure. I believe the amendment I'm offering today reflects that agreement, and I appreciate the willingness of the uh, committee staff, the majority, to work with the committee staff and the minority in getting this amendment in a position where I hope our colleagues will approve it. Will the gentleman yield? I, Pleased to yield, uh, yeah, This is a good amendment. I am pleased to support it, and I uh, uh, thank you for offering it.
Thank you. With yield back my time. Would the gentleman yield? Yes, be pleased to I, I would join uh, both of you in supporting this amendment. I appreciate uh, your suggestion of it. I think it makes good sense. It's good for consumers. It improves the FCC's process and hopefully their website. And I hope our colleagues support us. Thank you. Yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Is there further debate on the amendment? Seeing none, the vote occurs on the Waxman Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Are there further amendments to the bill? A gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Pompeo, for what purpose does it seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will read the title of the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 3309, as amended, offered by Mr. Pompeo of Kansas. Amendment will be considered as read. Uh, the staff will distribute the amendment, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I hope this is a bipartisan amendment as well. It's in the same vein as the amendment offered by Mr. Waxman, uh, attempting to get better information in the hands of, of the public so that we have a better, more clear, more transparent reporting. Today, uh, violations of the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, uh, which restrict telemarketers, uh, have to be dealt with, uh, and they are, they are growing as a percentage of all of the complaints. Unfortunately, today they are lumped in uh, as a series of uh, complaints from uh, citizens under wireless and wireline complaints. My amendment uh, simply uh, tries to break them out. Uh, it takes these complaints that have been on the rise, uh, lumps them in with other complaints, uh, and confuses folks who are trying to interpret the FCC's data. Uh, my amendment would set the record straight give the public a clearer picture of the growing problem that is uh, being found under TCPA and with those violations, which now represent over 80 to percent of wireless and wireline complaints. It's simply asking for a recharacterization of the data to separate TCPA complaints from non-TCPA complaints. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from California is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, I support this amendment. I think it makes sense, and I think that uh, uh, it really addresses uh, the public's rising temperature about uh, uh, about the calls, and also that it would um, it, it really doesn't make any sense the way it's structured now. So I, I think the amendment is a good one. I support it, and I think that we all should yield back. General Lady yields back. Are there further comments on the amendment? Seeing none, the vote occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Kansas. All those in favor will say aye. Aye. Those opposed will say no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Are there further amendments to the bill? General lady from California. Thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk at uh, EJS 14. Uh -huh. Clerk will report the title of the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 3309, as amended, offer, offered by Ms. Eshu of California. The uh, amendment will be considered as read. The staff will distribute the amendment, and the gentlelady is recognized for five minutes in support of her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm once again offering um, an amendment that provides a set of common-sense reforms to strengthen the FCC's effectiveness while improving transparency and accountability. My amendment would preserve the Federal Communication Commission Collaboration Act, which was incorporated into uh, H.R. 3309. Uh, this bipartisan reform, which I introduced last year, uh, is supported by our colleagues, uh, Representatives uh, Shimkus, Doyle, Matsui, Barton, and Stearns. Uh, it promotes greater collaboration by allowing three or more commissioners to talk to each other outside of an official public meeting. My amendment would ensure the FCC provides Congress with a progress report on the agency's compliance with Executive Order uh, 13579, as well as a semi-annual update on whether the Commission is publishing orders, actions, and the specific language of a proposed rule or amendment in a timely manner. My amendment would also adopt recommendations by the Administrative Conference, the ACUS, uh, a body comprised of administrative law experts who have specialized in improving federal agency procedures without unduly tying their, uh, uh, their hands. Uh, these changes are designed to increase opportunities for public participation and enhance the quality of information received by federal agencies like the FCC. 
uh, experts tell us uh, if this bill were enacted, the underlining, uh, underlying bill, it would take 15 years for the law to be resettled uh, after years of litigation. And I don't think any, any of us um, uh, want to see that. Uh, it would really create a mess in plain English. Uh, so that's why I'm urging my colleagues to support my amendment while rejecting the portions of uh, 3309, which will hinder the FCC's ability to act in the public interest. And uh, uh, I don't know if anyone else wants to speak. I'd be happy to uh, yield time to them. If not, um, yes, I'll yield to uh, uh, Congresswoman Matsui. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to speak in support of Congressman Ashley's amendment. This amendment accomplishes everything that the pro proponents of H.R. 3309 say they hope to achieve, but in a way that better ensures improved transparency and process at the FCC. Specifically, this amendment preserves a bipartisan FCC Collaboration Act that was incorporated into H.R. 3309, which some have testified would do more than any other measure to address many of the concerns outlined in H.R. 3309, including former Republican FCC Commissioner Abernathy. This amendment also includes several recommendations adopted in June by the Bipartisan Expert Agency Administrative Conference of the United States, ACUS. It directs the FCC to initiate a rulemaking proceeding to seek public comment on whether and how the Commission should, one, establish procedures to refresh the record in a proceeding, two, set minimum comment periods for a comment and reply comment subject to good cause exceptions, and three, adopt policies concerning submission of comments, data, or reports toward the end of the comment period. These are all issues the majority has identified as being problematic at the FCC, but this is a less prescriptive approach. I believe these are common sense solutions. Overall, the amendment frees up the commissioners to hold collaborative discussions and requires the FCC to consider innovations in the rulemaking process as recommended by the bipartisan ACUS without unduly tying the hands of the commission. Let's oversee the FCC and not disable it. I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting the SU amendment. I yield back my time to Congressman SU. Brother, generally yields back your time. Other members, the gentleman from Oregon is recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, seek time to oppose my, my friend and colleague's uh, amendment, substitute amendment. Uh, this is the equivalent of taking a very long, very shiny, very sharp uh, samurai sword, inserting it in the bill's navel and thrusting upward and out. It guts the bill. Um, and, and what it does is leave in place the sunshine reporting requirements, the sunshine, uh, the sunshine piece, which, by the way, uh, is almost I, I, I agree to put the sunshine piece into this because I think there are times under the right circumstances, I concur with my colleague, where the commissioners are hobbled in appropriate decision making by not being able to talk to each other. But in exchange for that, I think it's essential that we help the FCC put into statute the kinds of reforms that it will write that puts the public in the driver's seat, that, that allows the transparency, the openness um, that is needed in these agencies. And by the way, much of what we are proposing in the underlying bill, if this were not an independent agency, would fall directly under the requirements that the President has suggested in his executive order and that his Jobs Council has said agencies need to do. And so I, I, I have to reluctantly oppose this amendment uh, because it, it is a, a gutting amendment in many respects and uh, really takes away from the hard work we've done through our open and transparent process over the last year with public meetings, with uh, lots of discussions with current and former uh, FCC commissioners and chairs trying to find that sweet spot of not over-regulating the commission but asking them to set shot clocks, asking them to be more transparent, asking them to do the right things. We're in a little tussle right now with the FCC over its Universal Service Fund order. They voted on a press release, in effect. They voted on a draft. Then they circulated it all around in secret. And then they put it out, 751 pages. I've asked the FCC to show us 
what they actually voted on, and then show us what they actually put out as a rule. Because I think as taxpayers, as members of this committee, we ought to see how all that changed behind the walls and doors and computers of the FCC. Other independent agencies do not operate that way. Now, it may not surprise you that the FCC has dragged their feet and basically refused to give us that original document they voted on. That's like saying my colleague's amendment, Ms. Eshoo's amendment, is here, but we're going to vote on it, and then we're going to go back here, completely rewrite it, and put it out as a fait accompli. Nobody should support that kind of action. This is what happens at the FCC. That's why the underlying bill is so important to make what they do transparent. It's the public's business. Whether you're a consumer advocate or a company, you should have the right to see, to participate fully, and voice your concerns. And so uh, with that, I, I have to oppose the substitute amendment, uh, and uh, I would encourage my colleagues to do likewise. And I would yield back my time. Gentlemen, you back. Gentleman from California. I, I uh, seek recognition to uh, recognize for five minutes. Uh, speak on this amendment. I, I urge support for the issue of substitute. As Ms. Eshu noted, this amendment accomplishes everything that the proponents of H.R. 3309 say they hope to achieve, but in a way that better ensures improved transparency and process at the FCC. Specifically, the amendment preserves the issue Shimkus Bipartisan FCC Collaboration Act that was incorporated into H.R. 3309, which some have testified would do more than any other measure to address many of the concerns outlined in this bill. The amendment also includes several recommendations adopted in June by the Bipartisan Expert Agency, the Administrative Conference of the United States, the ACUS, after years of study, the ACUS calls on all agencies to develop best practices designed to increase opportunities for public participation and enhance the quality of information received by the agencies. Notably, ACUS does not recommend imposing these practices through statutory changes like we are considering today. Experts are worried about the unintended consequences of approaches like that which we have before us in this bill today. Instead, they recommended the agency be encouraged to come up with internal procedures. Overall, the amendment frees up the commissioners to hold collaborative discussions, requires the FCC to consider innovations in the rulemaking process, and uh, not go to the point where they're undoing unduly tying the hands of the uh, Commission. This bill creates a new set of procedures for the FCC. Under four, for 40 years, the Administrative Procedure Act has governed administrative agencies across the, the federal government. H.R. 3309 creates special procedural rules. It micromanages the way the FCC would do its job. And that was a point that many people have come to us with. The most common response was, when we asked them to review this bill was, why would anybody want to tie the agency up in knots like this and subject it to endless legal challenges? One expert told us industry lawyers would have a field day challenging and delaying FCC actions. Other experts told us it could take 15 years of litigation for the courts to clarify the meaning of the new requirements in this bill. Secondly, this legislation alters fundamentally the FCC ability to review transactions to assure they are in the public interest. Although DOJ and the FTC are charged with protecting competition, only the FCC is directed to protect the public interest when reviewing proposed mergers, and this bill would curta curtail this authority significantly. Uh, the H.R. 3309 requires the FCC to do the regulatory analysis contained in President Obama's executive order. I have no objection to the FCC doing these analyses. In fact, Chairman Janikowski is appropriately committed to doing it. The problem is that the bill makes each of the analyses required by the executive order subject to judicial review. So overall, the bill 
uh, is not a process reform, but fundamental reform of the Communications Act. And the uh, SU amendment strips away these micromanaging of the FCC, gives them the discretion to come up with the uh, ways to implement the recommendation of this bipartisan agency. I'm disappointed we're not able to come together to support a consensus bill. I know we have fundamental disagreements about how to reform the FCC, and I respect that. But I think we need to acknowledge that it is only through genuine compromise that we can see this measure become law. If we want to make political statements on the legislative road to nowhere, we should vote for the underlying bill. But if we want to send to the Senate a measure with strong bipartisan support that might have a chance of being enacted, I would urge our colleagues to vote for the SU substitute. I think the SU substitute gets us somewhere, accomplishes something, it's a compromise that makes sense, and the underlying bill ties the hands of the FCC, and I don't see that that's going to be acceptable uh, to become a law. Uh, it's a political statement, but it's not going to be a law. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I urge support for the issue. Mr. Amendment. Chairman. Gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry. Is Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to yield as much time as Mr. Walden desires. I thank uh, the vice chairman of the subcommittee, and I, I just want to touch on a couple of these points. First of all, the terms in the bill are drawn from well-established legal sources. Administrative Law Professor Ronald Levin testified the logical outgrowth test reflects existing D.C. Circuit case law. The good cause exemption to the notice of inquiry requirement tracks the good cause exception language of the Administrative Procedures Act. The requirement to identify market failures or actual consumer harms tracks with the executive orders from both Presidents Clinton and Bush. The requirement to conduct a cost-benefit assessment tracks the language of President Obama's 2011 executive order that each agency must, among other things, one, propose or adopt a regulation only after a reasoned determination that its benefits justify its costs, recognizing that some benefits and costs are difficult to quantify. Two, tailor its regulations to impose the least burden on society, consistent with obtaining regulatory objectives, taking into account, among other things, and to the extent practicable, the cost of cumulative regulations, close, close quote. The requirement to create a performance measure tracks the Government Performance Results Act of 1993. We didn't pull this stuff out of thin air. There is solid backdrop to everything that we're doing in this reform legislation. The bill defines economically significant and program activity based on the $100 million threshold that's been in executive orders on regulatory reform since President Reagan. The bill is designed actually to reduce litigation risk. Courts regularly defer to the Federal Communications Commission. acceptable to appeal. If potential litigation risk were the reason not to pass a law, no new law would be passed. We are reforming how this commission operates, and it's long overdue. And in terms of hamstringing, in many cases, what we're proposing here directs the FCC to implement the reforms itself, such as by setting its own shot clocks or setting up its own processes for sharing information with the commissioners and the public. Many of the reforms are based on policies advocated by Clinton and Obama executive orders, the President's Job Council, or the commissioners themselves. If the executive agencies can comply, why shouldn't the independent agencies comply, just like we're proposing with the FCC? The bill incorporates exceptions under current law. It even creates some new ones to allow the FCC to skip certain procedural obligations for good cause, such as emergencies. There are safety valves and off-ramps. The FCC rarely makes its decisions quickly, <laughs> providing more opportunity for better input from industry and the public, from consumer advocate groups and others will therefore not slow down the commission. It will just help generate better results. We've seen different commissions chaired by different people that have worked well and have not worked at all. What we're trying to do is incorporate best practices and give this FCC the opportunity through statute to write its own rules so that it becomes more transparent, 
and more accountable to the people it serves. And uh, with that, I would uh, recognize the gentleman for Louisiana, Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise. No, the, de the gentleman had stated it well from Morgan, so I yield back. Thank you. I, just to weigh in a little bit on this also is uh, I don't think, as my colleague from Oregon, I don't think it causes micromanaging because I think it's something that the FCC can do. I think the, I'm not a lawyer, but the legal analysis of, of current law is is solid. And, and I guess the concern with the amendment is the premise that we're going to allow the FCC to in five years tell us whether they're transparent or not and then reevaluate their ability to be transparent when we're not concerned they're very transparent now is, is the basic concern I have. So this really forces a more transparent system on them, which is the reason for the uh, legislation. And I support my colleague and yield back my time to the gentleman from Nebraska. Thank you. Uh, did, Mr. Dingle, did you wish 11 seconds? All right, thank you. I'll just, uh, Anna, I have four seconds. I'll just yield back. Chairman yields back. Uh, the other members wishing to speak? The gentleman uh, from Michigan thank you. first thank you, Mr. to chairman. recognize for five minutes. I, I want to begin by expressing great affection for the chairman of the subcommittee and great sympathy for him and the rest of the committee. And I understand the frustration of my colleagues about the way the FCC runs their business. Now, there's nobody in this room that's had more uh occasions to tilt swords with the fcc they are a sorry agency but but not because the agency is bad but because they've had a succession of sorry chairmen who have run the place poorly this committee has documented that now the the question we have before us is like the one that dick gregory had a long time ago somebody said should we have a new religion Gregory thought, and he said, no, don't need a new, reg new religion. All we need to do is to practice the one we got. And that's our problem. What we're going to do is to take and substitute a whole array of new responsibilities and legislation and procedural th duties upon the FCC. The Administrative Conference of the United States says it's going to take 15 years to get it settled out. Now, I don't know how many of us are on this committee are going to be around in 15 years to see that event occur, but I seriously doubt that there will be many of us, and I seriously doubt that it will occur. That it will occur. Having said these things, the kindest description I can give to this legislation is that it is legislated malpractice. Without the vaguest idea of what this is going to do, we're passing a whole new change in rules and regulations and orders and powers and authorities and limitations on the FCC. The courts are going to have a field day, and the lawyers are going to make money till hell won't hold it. Now, having said these problems, uh, if you want to create a fine mess, to adopt this legislation is the way to do it. If you want to perhaps mitigate some of the mischief that we would do but with this piece of legislation which has been dreamed up, I think, by the staff, because I think most of the members here are too smart to come up with this kind of nonsense. But, but if you want to create unending and unmitigated mischief, adopt the bill as it is. If you want to perhaps mitigate some of the mischief that it would, would be created by that, then adopt the issue amendment. And I want to commend her for it, and I want to thank her for offering it, because perhaps this will save this committee embarrassment as we have the chairman of the FCC before us time after time to explain what he's doing down there under the new legislative powers that he's got. And he's not going to know, and we're not going to know, and we're not going to know how to ask him questions about what he's doing. But in the process, everybody's going to look sublimely silly. And the end result of this is going to be that if you don't like what's going on now, you will really detest what is going to happen under the under this legislation if it is adopted. Having said all these nice things about the legislation, I would like to observe to my colleagues that there is a thing that this committee has the power to do. It's called oversight. You haul them up and you explain to them how the law is and what they ought to be doing. And you listen to a fellow by the name of Sam Rayburn, who used to enlighten the chairman of the FCC. 
On one occasion, the chairman of the FCC was sort of off base. So Sam called him in, and, he, and they had a long discussion. The guy walked out of the speaker's office much enlightened. Sam said to him, he said, son, just remember, you work for us, and everything will be OK. The chairman of the committee, the chairman of the oversight subcommittee, and the members of this committee working together have the power to control these things. We don't need to adopt another monstrous piece of legislation that's going to sow confusion around Washington in unlimited and unmitigated amounts. My prayer to the committee is adopt the SU amendment and to reject the legislation and start using oversight. Haul them up and let's help them understand. I had, I had one chairman just refuse to answer my correspondence down there because he said that he was afraid if the answer came out, he, it would create panic in Washington. And I observed to him that this made pretty good sense because if it's that bad, then by the great horn spoon, he ought to come out and tell us what he's about so that people can either sell their, sell their communication stock or leave town or move to Canada. The simple fact of the matter is we have to bring that matter under control. But giving them a whole array of new powers, duties, and challenges is, I assure you, not the way. It is the way of creating unmitigated misery, mischief, and trouble, but of course, wonderful and lucrative practices for litigators, lawyers, and lobbyists. I urge you to adopt the amendment and reject the bill. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Chairman's time has expired. Mr. The Chair Chairman. would recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to the gentlelady's amendment. I would say with greatest affection and respect to the former chairman of the committee who just spoke, since there are three former chairmen of this committee on the dais, be careful when you characterize other chairmen of other agencies as sorry. They may um, return the favor. I do share your opinion. I think that um, some of the chairmen and former chairmen of the FCC have been less than optimal. but. Uh, uh, this, let, this bill that Mr. Uh, Walden has introduced is a real reform bill. And some of us, yourself included, have been on this committee a number of years actually trying to move an FCC uh, reform bill. This is such an animal. Uh, it may not be perfect, and some of the items may need to be uh, modified or improved, but it is a great first step, and I would not throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think we should commend Mr. Walden and Mr. Upton and others who've worked on it for moving the bill and worked to perfect it, uh, not with all due respect to my gentle lady friend, but good friend from uh, California, uh, offer an amendment that, that substantially doesn't move the ball forward. So I, I would support the underlying bill and oppose the amendment, and I'd be happy to yield to Mr. Walden I, if I, he wishes. I thank, uh, I thank the gentleman from Texas for offering. So I think it always helps to go back and get away from the hyperbole and the, uh, and the history and get into what we're talking about here before us now. This bill is designed to promote transparency by reforming the FCC. Now, some may want to defend the processes downtown at the portals all they want. I'm not in that camp. So what does it do? It, it says that the specific text of proposed regulations in its notices of proposed rulemakings, that it has to make those available. Anybody object to that? That at least 30 days each for public and industry comments and replies on proposed rules. It requires the FCC to provide at least 30 days. It requires the FCC to make what, what it's going to vote on public and before it votes at least 30 days for public and industry comment on reports before relying on them. So people have time to digest this. This is one of the biggest sectors of our economy controlled by three people who want to be able to do this behind closed doors, vote in public on something that isn't what becomes the end product, and then publish it a week or a month or whenever they want later. The USF reform is a perfect example of that. 751 pages put out. We don't know what they actually voted on and who changed what between then and the outcome. 
It requires adequate opportunity for comment on ex parte filings before the commission makes its decisions relying upon them. It requires in advance the text of an item scheduled for a vote at an open meeting. Now, I come from a state that prides itself on open meeting process and public work being public, not done privately. To promote transparency requires the FCC to provide the status of all open rulemaking proceedings and proposed decisions. Tell us what you're doing and where it stands. There's a lot of commerce that gets held up because nobody knows where it is in the process. And it requires the text of its decisions be made public within seven days of adoption. Is that asking too much of a commission that works for the taxpayers and the public? To say, tell us what you're working on, make it available public, do your process more publicly, and when you're done, take a week, but put it out there. Don't take months. And then we said, you know, it does make sense, and I agree with my colleague from California, to allow for the commissioners sometimes to get their heads together and talk under certain limited conditions. They can't do that today. But then we also have seen a case where a chairman basically ran the place himself and denied votes where there were four commissioners ready to approve something, he wouldn't put it up. So we dealt with that by allowing a bipartisan majority of commissioners to draft an order, to put a full commission vote, a decision that could be adopted under delegated authority, to add an item to the public meeting. So if, if you do have a chairman gone rogue, you can have a bipartisan group of the commissioners put something on the agenda and try and move things forward. That's called democracy the last time I looked. And so these are the things, if you want to get into the specifics that we're doing in this bill, and many others be happy to talk about as time permits. Mr. Gentlemen, Chairman, time I yield back. Expired. I ask unanimous consent the gentleman be given an additional minute if he yield to me. Gentleman from Texas. Um, I would uh, ask for an, a minute and be happy to yield to the former chairman, Mr. Waxman. I thank you very much. I, I think that a lot of what is proposed in this legislation would be very helpful. And members should note that a lot of it's already being done. For example, Chairman Janikowski has been moving the FCC in the right direction regarding process since he became chairman. The number of notices of proposed rulemaking uh, that contain the full text of proposed rules has increased from 38 to 86 percent. The FCC closed 999 dormant dockets, which represent a third of the agency's open docket proceedings. The FCC has reduced the number of pending broadcast applications. The FCC reformed ex parte rules to require more information and disclosure. These are things that are being done, and we all support that. This legislation would mandate it. What we disagree with is the mandate and the parts of the legislation, the underlying bill, that tie the hands of the agency. And uh, that's where our disagreement comes in. Would the in. gentleman yield? I, 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 be happy to if I had time. The gentleman's time has expired. I ask unanimous consent uh, that the gentleman from Texas be given <laughs> an additional minute. minute so that he could well, yield. Without to objection. Mr. Walden. Yeah, I, I, I yield to the gentleman from Oregon. I, I, I thank the gentleman. This I, I guess, business is fun. You know, actually, this is how we should have these discussions. I, I, I guess the question I'd ask my friend from California, Mr. Waxman, is I hear how we tie the hands of the commission. What I'd like to see is specifically which of these things I've outlined leads you to that conclusion. When it comes to shot clocks, we have the commission determine what the lengths of those should be. We just say, have them. You decide. I mean, our original draft, which I think may have been what drew the ire of the, uh, some of the outside groups, we had a hearing on it. We put everything out there, including a really rusty kitchen sink or two. And you know what? We actually used a public open process and did something that doesn't always happen around this place and had people comment on it and come back and go, you know, some of those are really stupid ideas when we took them out. And people said, you're being too restrictive here. You're, you are tying the commission. Why don't you have them set the, the rules for what they think the timelines are and just report back, which is what we, we changed to. So I hope you'll read the current draft uh, that's before us today. Gentlemen's time has expired. I think we're about gentlelady from California. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd uh, like to... Uh, um, uh, ask for a unanimous consent 
uh, that uh, uh, a letter to both you and to Mr. Waxman from 45 uh, public interest organizations uh, uh, be placed in the record in their opposition to the underlying bill. Would that Italy yield to me? I'd be glad to. I just I don't want to take any more time of the committee. Uh, uh, if no one would object, I'd like to put into the record some answers to the points raised by Mr. Walden, particularly how it, uh, the H.R. 3309 fundamentally alters the FCC's authority to review transactions and it, the bill creates unique statutory requirements that apply only to the FCC. Well, but, but if the gentleman or gentleman would yield, I appreciate you putting those to the record, but we're voting on this now. So at some point, I hope we have time where you can actually point to the bill so we could see where those are. Without objection, the material will be put into the record. I Thank think you, we're Mr. about Chairman. ready to vote on this amendment. Are there other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Seeing none. The vote occurs on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from California. Those in favor will say aye. 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 The opposed will say no. 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 The roll, no call. roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes no. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus votes no. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts votes no. Mrs. Bono Mack. Mrs. Bono Mack votes no. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden votes no. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry votes no. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers votes no. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick votes no. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan votes no. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes no. Mrs. Blackburn. Mrs. Blackburn votes no. Mr. Bilbray. Mr. Bilbray votes no. Mr. Bass. Mr. Bass votes no. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry votes no. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes no. Mrs. McMorris Rogers. Mr. Harper. Mr. Harper votes no. Mr. Lance. Mr. Lance votes no. Mr. Cassidy. Mr. Cassidy votes no. Mr. Guthrie. Mr. Guthrie votes no. Mr. Olson. Mr. Olson votes no. Mr. McKinley. Mr. McKinley votes no. Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner votes no. Mr. Pompeo. Mr. Pompeo votes no. Mr. Kinzinger. Mr. Kinzinger votes no. Mr. Griffith. Mr. Griffith votes no. Mr. Waxman. Aye. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Dingle. Aye. Mr. Dingle votes aye. Mr. Markey. Mr. Towns. Mr. Pallone. Aye. Mr. Pallone votes aye. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Aye. Ms. Eshoo votes aye. Mr. Engel. Aye. Mr. Engel votes aye. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes aye. Ms. DeGette. Ms. DeGette votes aye. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps votes aye. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle votes aye. Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez votes aye. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee votes aye. Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Ross. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson votes no. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield votes aye. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes aye. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes aye. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen votes aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes aye. Chairman Upton. Chairman Upton votes no. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Stearns votes no. Mr. Whitfield votes no. Ms. McMorris Rogers. Mr. Scalise. Mrs. McMorris Rogers votes no. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise votes no. Mr. Towns. Mr. Towns votes aye. Are there other members wishing to cast a vote? Seeing none, the clerk will report the tally.
Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 18 ayes, 32 nays. 18 ayes, 32 nays? Correct. The uh, amendment is not agreed to. The chair would recognize the gentleman from Texas to strike the last word. Mr. Thank Green. you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to strike the last word. I know oftentimes in our committee we have staff members who've worked with us uh, for many years who, have, who are going on to other things, and I just wanted to recognize my legislative director who's been with me for nine years, Abigail Pinkley, who is leaving at the end of this week and actually going not too far because over the years she's worked on health issues and the Affordable Care Act and on our effort to expand community-based health centers. Uh, Abby's actually going to go to the National Association of Community-Based Health Centers. But I know this session she's worked with uh, Chairman Shimkus and his staff on the Environment and Economy Subcommittee. But I know with Congressman Whitfield and, and a number of members, Dr. Murphy, Dr. Burgess, and Mr. Barton, we worked on transparency and lots of other health care issues. So obviously I think our committee will miss Abby, but I know I will. And, uh, but I sure appreciate the courtesies over the last number of years with her and, uh, and just wanted to recognize her today before she leaves. Abby, thank you. We wish her well. We wish her well. Are there other members wishing to offer an amendment? Mr. Stearns. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the title. <laughs> amendment to H.R. 3309, as amended, offered by Mr. Stearns of Florida. And the amendment will be considered as read. The staff will distribute the amendment, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. All right, Mr. Chairman, I won't probably take the whole five minutes. Uh, this bill, H.R. 3309, does a lot to improve the process at the FCC. That's been our debate this morning. However, my colleagues, I believe, is missing one key component, hiring more engineers at the FCC. In 1948, the FCC had 720 engineers on staff. Today, it has fewer than 270, an astonishingly 63% reduction. Even though the FCC now must face more technical issues concerning broadband, advanced wireless communication, commercial cable, and satellite industries. Therefore, this amendment incorporates my bipartisan bill, H.R. 2102, the FCC Commissioner's Technical Resources Enhancement Act, into H.R. 3309, the FCC process reform legislation we have before us today. Importantly, my bill is already co-sponsored by Congressman Bobby Rush, Jerry McInerney, and Tom Petrie uh, from Wisconsin. Specifically, H.R. 2102 modifies existing law so that each commissioner may hire an additional staff member, an electrical engineer, or computer specialist, scientist rather, computer scientist, to provide in-depth technical consultation as well as an interface with the Office of Engineering and Technology and other commissioner staff, technical staff. My colleagues, currently the statute limits each commissioner to appoint three professional assistants, which typically are lawyers, legal advisors. But having both legal and technical advisors will provide the FCC commissioners with the necessary staff experience to properly address the increasingly complex technical and legal matters today. So importantly, CBO has already estimated that the net budgetary impact of the bill would be insignificant. The language only permits the commissioners to hire an engineer. It does not require a commissioner to do so. Therefore, for commissioners who believe that this provision is not necessary, nothing in this amendment would force them to take an, on an additional employee. Moreover, fees collected by the commission would simply offset, offset the compensation for this employee. On February 22, 2002, President Obama signed into law important legislation giving the FCC the authority to create a spectrum auction that would determine the fate of our wireless future in this country. And while the contours of this auction will largely be crafted at the staff level, the commissioners will supervise, guide, and shape the ultimate policy. Although the legal and policy advisors to the commissioners continue to serve an important role, I honestly believe it's time we allow the commissioners to appoint an engineer to inform their decisions so they can ask him about these technical matters. So the purpose, Mr. Chairman, of this amendment is to provide the necessary support to the agency that we are entrusting with determining the future of our country's telecommunication policy, extremely important. I would hope all my colleagues would consider this. However, 
as I understand after talking to the chairman of the telecommunications and the chairman of this committee, that this might not be the appropriate time to do this. But I do want to make the argument and hope that, uh, that uh, my leaders will consider at some later date putting this in part of the package. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous would consent to withdraw my amendment at this time. Would the gentleman yield? I'd be glad to yield. Uh, I'd like to thank the gentleman for his amendment. Uh, I think it's a sensible one, um, and it should be built in at some point. I'm sorry you're withdrawing it, but uh, 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 I think uh, uh, it's important to state for the record that I support it. I think it's a worthwhile amendment, and uh, uh, thank him for offering it. You I thank the gentlelady. The gentleman withdraws his amendment. Look forward to working with him, uh, as I know Mr. Walden does too. Gentlelady from Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, the clerk will report the title of the amendment. Amendment 005. And the amendment, the clerk will report the title. Amendment to H.R. 3309 as amended, offered by Ms. Christensen of the Virgin Islands. The amendment will be considered as read, and the staff will distribute the amendment, and the general lady is recognized for five minutes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, uh, plan to offer this amendment and withdraw with the clarification. My amendment is offered to simply clarify that to the extent that any provision of the FCC Reform Act conflicts with the Administrative Procedures Act, the Administrative Procedures Act controls unless otherwise express, expressly provided. H.R. 3309 dramatically alters standard administrative law practice and procedure by applying unique statutory process requirements to the FCC. These requirements would amend the Communications Act to mandate how the agency should operate internally with detailed requirements for the most basic regulatory actions, such as specific timelines associated with notice and comment rulemaking proceedings. H.R. 3309 would undo over 60 years of federal court precedents under the Administrative Procedures, Procedure Act and create uncertainty and confusion for the FCC and interested take, stakeholders going forward. This FCC will be subjected to endless court challenges by industry that could take well over a decade to resolve. A key reason the APA has been important and successful bedrock of re regulatory law is that it applies uniformly across federal agencies. If we do choose to statutorily impose new or different obligations on agencies, we should do so through legislation that applies to all agencies and does not just single out one. By taking the agency outside the precedent and course of future development of the APA, H.R. 3309 sows the seeds of uncertainty, confusion, and additional work for the FCC, for consumers, entities regulated by the agency, as well as the courts. Contrary to the purported goals of this legislation, H.R. 3309 will make the FCC less effective, less agile, and less transparent. So I'm offering this amendment today to simply ensure that in the event of conflict between H.R. 3309 and APA, that APA controls. And um, with that, I will yield back the balance of my time if no one else Does wants it, any time on it. Gentlelady wish to withdraw her amendment? E yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, can you just, uh, the way the law is written, is, the is it cl clear that APA does control in the event of a conflict? Yeah, I would address that to the council. Based on how section three is currently written, uh, it's the opinion of the council that this would have no effect on the law most likely. So yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I yield back and I do withdraw the amendment. Chairman Lady yeah, withdraws her amendment. Are there further amendments to the bill? Gentlelady yeah. Lady from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Staff will report the title of the amendment. 13. Amendment to H.R. 3309 as amended, amended, offered by Ms. Eshoo of California. 
And the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentlelady is recognized for five minutes in support of her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm offering uh, this amendment today to secure disclosure for the voting public. In an election season in which voters will be deluged, are being deluged, with hundreds of millions of dollars in political ads, many of them aired under misleading names, voters are clamoring for transparency. My amendment is very simple, and it adheres to the same principles many of my colleagues have supported before. If an organization buys political advertising time on television, including cable, satellite, broadcast, as well as radio, it would be required to disclose its large donors, those who give $10,000 or more to air the ad. It's a fair amendment because it applies across all mediums. Whomever pays more than $10,000 to air a political ad, their name will be disclosed in the public inspection file. Our constituents, the voters, are smart. But they also have a right to know, and with this knowledge, they can draw their own conclusions. I believe sunlight is the best disinfectant, and I ask my colleagues to join me in supporting this common sense and important transparency measure. And um, uh, I don't know if anyone would like to speak on this. I'd be happy to yield time on my side. Mr. Uh, I'd be happy to yield to Mr. Dingle. I'd like to thank the general lady for yielding, and, and I support rigorous reporting requirements for advertising. These, uh, uh, <laughs> these are important to increase the transparency in our democracy. However, this language in this, uh, the bill, I hope, is interpreted reasonably unless we adopt this amendment by the FCC. Broadcasters should not be held liable uh, with their license and balance over issues they have no control over. If a super PAC, for example, misrepresents facts to a broadcaster and that broadcaster files with the FCC, that should not penalize a broadcaster because super PAC should be responsible for the false information. Broadcasters can't be uh, the cop on the beat, and we have to FCC or, or the FEC to do that job. And with that, I'd be glad, glad that my colleagues uh, has the amendment. I look forward to supporting it. Thank you, and I appreciate your comments. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Be happy to yield time to. If not, I'll uh, um, yield back. General lady yields back. Chair would recognize a gentleman from Oregon. I, I thank the gentleman. I, I, I'm going to rise in uh, opposition to this amendment. I, I want to clarify one thing too. I was just reading through the amendment because in your remarks you said it would reply to apply to radio broadcasters as well. I don't see that in here. It appears to only be video. Is that correct or not? Well, uh, uh, responding to the gentleman, it uh, uh, it uh, uh, applies to all television. Well, yeah, I'm talking about radio. All, all broadcast licenses. So all broadcast television, licenses. Television, including cable, satellite, broadcast, as well as radio. So it, it doesn't single any group out. It just applies across the board, which I think the voting public uh, deserves. I appreciate that clarification. Um, I, I guess while I'm, I'm not opposed to disclosure, I'm not sure this, well, I'm, I am sure, this is not the proper place to do this. We're talking about how we reform the Federal Communications Commission's processes. Um, I think this uh, is worthy of discussion in another place and another time, but uh, I, I don't think this is that place or time. Um, obviously, there are lots of questions about Citizens United and super PACs and all of that and how they disclose. Uh, I, I think this does put the, the burden back on the broadcaster. The broadcaster um, in these cases um, is on the line anyway as it is for the content of the message. Unlike one of us buying time in a broadcast environment, there the broadcaster is not on the line for the content of the message. We are. Third-party expenditures, um, they share a responsibility uh, to make sure that it's not knowingly false uh, when it's put out there. And so they have a lot more flexibility. 
I, I don't know how someone picks just a arbitrary $10,000 amount or more. I, I know you've got to pick something somewhere. But I, I think this whole issue needs to be dealt with in a more comprehensive manner uh, in a different venue. And so I would, uh, I would oppose this yield? amendment on this basis. I, sure, of course. Uh, I, I just want to uh, observe that the parliamentarian uh, found the, uh, uh, the amendment oh. Uh, to be uh, germane. germane. C certainly, so I it, understand uh, that. It, it does fit with what we're doing, and uh, I was prepared to withdraw if it was not found to be um, uh, in order. So certainly, uh, Re reclaiming I my wanted, time, uh, it, I, and I was not to... alleging that it was not germane. There are lots of things that could be germane to uh, the Communications Act and the underlying law, but don't really pertain to uh, the discussion we're, we're having here about FCC process reform. This more falls in the campaign process reform, and so I would oppose and yield back my time. Well, the gentleman yield? The gentleman, well, the gentleman yield, yield. yielded back. The, uh, oh, yeah, I yielded okay. back, oh. sorry. Uh, well, the well, gentleman yielded back his time. Given a unanimous consent to reclaim your minute. 55. I reclaim the minute and, and yield to my colleague from uh, Illinois if the committee's okay with well, it. Well, thank you. And I, I think uh, just to, to add on to what you're saying, I think, again, the purpose of this bill is not to really get into campaign finance law and details. And I mean, there's a time and a place for that. And I think it may be a discussion that's worthy of having. But the purpose of this is just simply to say, look, the current chairman has really put a lot of process into place, which I think is good, really opens up the commission, uh, really is getting people engaged and understanding of what's happening. Uh, but we just want to take some of the, the good things that he's already done, expand upon it and open up the process of the commission. It's just basically giving the public the ability to take a, a look inside their government to see what's going on to ensure that there's rules in place. And again, it's, it's, it's really taking into account a lot of what's been happening now. So again, when it comes to, you know, talking about campaign finance reform and all this kind of stuff, that's a discussion that's worthy of having eventually. Uh, but I think that's not necessarily what this bill intends to do, as we just want to open up the process. And I thank you and I yield back. Does the gentleman yield back his time? Gentleman yields back. Chairman, or the chair would recognize the gentleman from California for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we've been told this bill is about openness, transparency, uh, let the public know what's going on. This amendment furthers that purpose. Uh, today, the FCC requires broadcasters, cable providers, and satellite providers to maintain and make available for public, ins uh, public inspection request to purchase airtime related to political advertising. Right now, the FCC does that. That's so the public will know who is going to buy the time. But there's no requirement to disclose who actually pays for the advertisement. The public ought to know about that, too. And this amendment would accomplish that goal. Rather, the file simply needs to contain now the name of the person or entity requesting airtime. But it's easy to see how viewers might be confused who's actually financing the advertisements they see and hear every day. Mild-sounding names like tax taxpayers against something or other uh, can hide the fact that the advertisement is actually being funded by a corporation or a limited group, group of wealthy individuals who may well have a vested economic interest but the public doesn't know that. In California, we have a lot of ballot proposals. And when the public finds out that the oil companies are sponsoring something that they say is good for the environment, that, it, that, that has a psychological effect. Disclosure is important. Openness and transparency. We've been told that's what this bill is all about. Political ads can have a great impact on the outcome of an election because the broadcast medium has the ability to reach vast numbers of citizens. A recent study revealed that as, as of this January, 95% of spending during the 2012 election cycle was backed by outside groups as opposed to candidates and political parties. As a result of the 2010 Supreme Court decision in Citizens United versus the FEC, uh, we've exacerbated the problems of insufficient disclosure in political advertising. Uh, this amendment simply recognizes the incredible impact of such advertising and th that it can have on the outcome of an election. And it does not increase the burden on broadcasters or cable providers and satellite providers in maintaining public inspection files 
related to political advertisements. Since they're already required to do this, keep a record of requests to purchase airtime and, and on, on file at their stations. So it's, uh, I think it's a well, well crafted, well worth amendment. This is the time for this amendment. This is what this bill is all about. Let's don't take something and say, this is a good idea, but it ought to be considered another time, another place. This is the time and place where we're being told legislation to provide transparency and openness is uh, before us, and this is the time and place for us to adopt this amendment. I urge my colleagues to uh, vote for the issue amendment. Gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Texas is recognized, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. To those individuals, uh, my colleagues that express an interest in maybe looking at this issue uh, in broader terms, I would welcome their co-sponsorship of H.R. 4010, which is the Disclose Act. Uh, but this is a sincere and could be a very effective way of taking one step in the right direction. This is an opportunity. It is about transparency, and it's not really placing any additional burden on our broadcasters. The truth of the matter is that the great bulk of the money is being spent via these individuals that own the stations, run in the ads, and so on, and it would be appropriate that we'd have this collection of information, again, so that the voter is knowledgeable, we know who's behind the advertising, something that we don't have presently. And I'm hoping that we will be able to address, as I've said, on a wider scale. Until that day, we have an opportunity today to do something that will educate the voter. And I would yield back at this time, and I support, of course, the amendment. Will the gentleman yield the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Dingle? I will. I will. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized. For I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I express my great affection for the chairman of the subcommittee and the chairman of the full committee, and I want to make clear I support the amendment. But I think we all need to know a little more and to understand how this is going to impact what this bill is going to do. Now, the committee's been charging around happily with a bucket on its head with no idea what we're doing or, or what will be the consequences of the legislation. And we've already amended, I think, uh, the Federal Communications Act, the Administrative Procedure Act, and I'm not quite clear how many others, but probably the Freedom of Information Act and a number of other statutes that will relate to how the business of the nation and the business of the FCC is being conducted. And I don't think there's anybody in this room and certainly nobody on the staff who knows what this is all going to do. In any event, having said that, uh, I, I think we desperately need openness here. We've got a bunch of billionaires and millionaires who are pouring millions of dollars into uh, the elections of this country under these super PACs with nobody having the vaguest idea of who they are, what they're up to, what they want, or what will be the consequences of it. But they're literally able to secretly buy the U.S. government and buy the next election. And we certainly have to find that. Now, the, the, one of the questions we have is, are we going to hang uh, criminals with this or innocent men? The history of election law is that the criminals get away and the innocent men go to jail. This is hardly a, a, a comforting thought to me or to anybody who studies our election system. In any event, having said that, Mr. Chairman, I am asking the attention of both the chairman of the subcommittee and the chairman of the full committee. I'm hoping that this bill is going to be vetted with all of the stakeholders and we'll have some appreciation of what the different provisions of the legislation mean most specifically those which are relating to liability in the case of non-compliance with the disclosure requirements. Uh, do you think that the chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. Chairman, or the chairman of the full committee can comfort me by telling me that we're going to go into these questions to find out what assurances we have with regard to potential liabilities uh, in the case of non-compliance with the disclosure requirements. I yield either to the chairman well, of the subcommittee or the chairman I, of the full if, uh, I'd be happy to try and take the question and get you an answer. I will yield to the gentleman with enormous respect. And I, and I, I return that. I, I get, is the question regarding this amendment and the liability that might ensue from it? Pardon? 
I'm, we're discussing here the amendment, I tell my good friend. And, and, and in so, other words, I want to know what is going to be the liability of uh, persons involved here in, with non-compliance with the disclosure amendments. Well, we gonna, I, will we have the staff look into it so we have some appreciation of, of what will be the liabilities and what will be the risks and the dangers yeah. to persons who might be involved, probably innocently, but might be headed on a, on a, on a quick trip I, to the jail it, I, I, I think the gentleman, the gentleman raises really significant questions because this issue has not been vetted. Uh, along the way in the subcommittee or in any of the hearings. It, it was not an issue that, that had been brought up and discussed. Uh, here in our, we had a number of hearings. We've had a lot of discussions. This is kind of new. I, I'm ask, I was wondering myself if what the definition of political programming is on line seven because I'm curious who all is uh, captured by this and maybe the council. I don't know if council can speak specifically to the definition of political programming as it's found on line seven, because that would be a question, Mr. Chairman Emeritus, that, that would be in play here. What all do, does the broadcaster have to look at? What is the term political programming? Who all does that capture? How do they determine that? That may be defined in statute. I just don't know. That's why I don't think, frankly, this is the right place. And I, I appreciate my colleague, uh, Mr. Waxman from California now. Um, advocating for this amendment in the notion this bill will actually pass and become law because earlier he wasn't quite so sure that was going to happen. But I would yield to counsel uh, if we can find even a definition because I think that is, is one this, of those Mr. issues. Dingle's it's about the liability. It's about the – he yielded to me, I believe. Oh, it, I, it's, I was happy to yield to my good friend. Yeah, uh, it, it's a, the, those are the, the legitimate questions. So I, I would yield does, back. Does the gentlewoman wish to uh, yield? Uh, thank I, you, I yield um, um, Mr. Dingle. Um, I think it's important to uh, establish uh, that the amendment does not bring the burden to any of the broadcasters. Uh, it's the responsibility of those requesting uh, uh, the, uh, the airtime, the broadcast time, the satellite time, the cable time, the radio time. Uh, it's up to them uh, to um, uh, place in the file uh, the information that is um, uh, part of the amendment. So uh, uh, the burden does not fall to any of the uh, uh, broadcasters. Would, and I would, would thank the, you for yielding. Would the gentleman yield? Cause my, my time has run out, but oh, if I yeah. can have, I ask you to have, I have two additional minutes and I'll be happy. I, I appreciate that friend. because then, first of all, I think we have to ask the question political programming because the broadcaster is responsible for getting this certification from each entity sponsoring political programming. So we need to know how that's defined in statute and it may be. The second is kind of an interesting point, too, on line 10, as I read this for, for the first time, that, uh, so that, that they require this certification for, or, uh, from an entity uh, finding out who contributed 10000 or more to such an entity during the two-year period preceding the request for broadcast time. The reason I raise that is it would be real easy to get around this particular amendment because an entity could put in the request for time as the committee for, you name it, buy the time, and then get the donation in. So, because uh, this says that they want to know the donors in the past two years. Well, those donors may not have anything to do with the current buy. Because I get, I was in the business. We would get requests from ad agencies for time, and they may or may not act on that request. This is predicated on a request for time. And so, therefore, you could have a request for time, and it may not reflect who's actually paying for it if you're reaching back two years looking at big donors. Because you could have a different entity. Heck, I'd just create a different entity each time and get right around this. So I don't think this serves the purpose you're trying to get to. If, if, if the gentleman would permit, the purpose of my comments were not to discuss in detail what's going on here, because I simply do not, in fact, know. But it is to say that... that if we're going to proceed on this, we ought to at least, as we go forward, have the staff to look at us and tell us what it means, what the perils are, and whether or not we ought, in fact, to continue or whether this ought to be amended or adjusted or addressed Mr. in some Dingle, would you or, yield in your or otherwise fashion. Mr. Dingle, and, and would you I'll, yield? I'll yield to the gentleman, yes. I thank you. Uh, if we're going to look, uh, I think we ought to accept this amendment 
because we're going to have to look at it and refine it and figure out some of these details. That's not a reason to be against it. But the whole bill is going to have to be evaluated, carefully revised, and well, compromised. Permit, I'm not to opposed law. to the amendment. I just want to make sure we look right. at it. Good and, point. And that, and that the leadership of the committee sees we go into it in order to know what we're doing and to make sure that there are not some very red faces on the committee. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Uh, Chairman. There are, I think we're ready to vote on Mr. this. Mr. Chairman. Minute. I know you want to vote, but I want to... I, I don't want to pile on. I just want to uh, speak against the amendment and, and understand uh, this path that we're going down to. First of all, the, the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech. Now, the question, this is, this is a great debate for uh, the Judiciary Committee, the Constitution prerogatives. Is disclosure abridging the freedom of speech? Uh, I think the Supreme Court has ruled that money is speech in, in current rulings. Uh, does uh, political programming, who's going to define political programming? And now how is that part of this whole uh, debate we're having on the free exercise of religion in and, other venues in the, in the health care debate? And is the free exercise of religion now going to be thrown into political speech? I, I understand the concern. I've wrestled with campaign finance laws. We've all been attacked by unnamed individuals. I'm coming down on the position now that let it all come, I'll sort it out, it's free speech, First Amendment principles, and that's kind of where I'm standing on. So I, don't, I definitely gentlemen don't think yield. this is the right... The gentlemen, yield. The gentlemen yield. Well, yield. let me finish. I don't think this is the right venue, first of all, uh, because if you're going to do campaign finance law and you're going to fight the judiciary constitutional First Amendment... That's a Judiciary Committee provision. Uh, and then, um, so I'm not comfortable with the amendment. I want to first yield to my colleague from Oregon, Mr. Walden. Well, I, I appreciate the gentleman yielding, and I'll, I'll try and get through this. You could drive a, a, a 527 freight truck through this because all you have to do is create a new sub entity, request the time. It has no donors from the prior two years. And then you buy the time, you, you, you reserve the time. And then you go get the donors, and you repeat the process. So I, I understand what you're trying to get at, and I'm, I'm, I, I think this is an issue that, as a Congress, we need to look at is how we get more openness. I just think the FCC and the broadcaster should be the one doing this. I think the, perhaps the FEC or, or someone else should, but um, I, even then, this doesn't get at what you're trying to do because all you do is create a – create a new committee for the preservation of whatever or the opposition to whatever. It has no prior donors because it's new. It's simple as filing. And I, I yield back. Gentlemen, Mr. Gentleman, yield. Yield. Gentleman, yield. Gentleman, yield. Mr. Mr. Waxman, can I just get Mr. Gonzalez first and then I'll... Well, real quick on, on uh, political speech, freedom of speech. We already know Citizens United, the Supreme Court said, look, disclosure, timely disclosure and such mm -hmm. is something that could be contemplated uh, given when they exercise such freedom of speech, either uh, individually, corporations, entities, super PACs, whatever we want to call them. So I, I don't think disclosure it, it tramples or in any way threatens any of the constitutional protections we have. Secondly, as far as how some individuals or entities may be able to circumvent the intent of this law, that's always going to happen out there. But that is not a reason why we shouldn't be doing that which we can do at this point in time, given that we probably aren't going to be doing anything that is more expansive. This is a step in the right direction, so I, I think we can respond to those concerns, and, and I yield back, and I thank you. claiming my time, Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much for yielding uh, to me. I, I agree uh, with what Mr. Gonzalez just said on the constitutional question. I would observe that uh, uh, some of our Republican colleagues who have talked about this amendment are finding it, finding it hard but they're straining to look for a reason to be against it. And, uh, and I think that we ought to be for it, and if there are little provisions that need to be changed, we could change them as part of the bill. The bill in its present form is not going to be law. It micromanages the FCC in a way that is not going to be acceptable, in my view, to others that are going to have to 
pass on this legislation than the Senate Reclaiming. and the President. And if so I, I would say let's put this in the bill and let's review the whole issue. But don't exclude this from the bill because I think it makes this a much better bill for openness and discourse. Reclaiming my time and yielding the balance to uh, my colleague from Tennessee. I, th I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I will just note with my colleagues that I am thrilled to see their interest in transparency and who is giving to different organizations. And I would like to remind you all that about nine months ago, I asked an organization that came before us for a list of their contributors. They said they would be happy to comply. And uh, we at the subcommittee are still waiting to get a list of those donors and participants with free press. With that, I yield back. Time has uh, expired. I think we're ready to vote on this uh, amendment. Uh, we'll ask for a roll call vote. All those in favor will say aye. All those opposed say no. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes no. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus votes no. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts votes no. Mrs. Bono Mack. Mrs. Bono Mack votes no. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden votes no. Mr. Terry. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers votes no. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick votes no. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Burgess. Mrs. Blackburn. Mrs. Blackburn votes no. Mr. Bilbray. Mr. Bass. Mr. Bass votes no. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry votes no. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise votes no. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes no. Mrs. McMorris Rogers. Mr. Harper. Mr. Harper votes no. Mr. Lance. Mr. Lance votes no. Mr. Cassidy. Mr. Cassidy votes no. Mr. Guthrie. Mr. Guthrie votes no. Mr. Olson. Mr. Olson votes no. Mr. McKinley. Mr. McKinley votes no. Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner votes no. Mr. Pompeo. Mr. Pompeo votes no. Mr. Kinzinger. Mr. Kinzinger votes no. Mr. Griffith. Mr. Griffith votes no. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle votes aye. Mr. Markey. Mr. Towns. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo votes aye. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel votes aye. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes aye. Ms. DeGette. Ms. DeGette votes aye. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps votes aye. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle votes aye. Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez votes aye. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee votes aye. Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Ross. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson votes aye. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield votes aye. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes aye. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen votes aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes aye. Chairman Upton. Chairman Upton votes no. Mr. Stearns votes no. Mr. Whitfield votes no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes no. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry votes no. Mr. Bilbray. Mr. Bilbray votes no. Are there other members wishing to cast a vote? Seeing none, the, the uh, clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 16 ayes, 30 nays. 16 ayes, 30 nays. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments to the bill? Seeing none, the question now occurs on favorably reporting the bill as amended to the House. All those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Roll the, call. The roll call is requested. The clerk will report the, will call the roll. Mr. Barton. 
Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns votes aye. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield votes aye. Mr. Mr. Shimkis. Mr. Shimkis votes aye. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts votes aye. Mrs. Bonomack. Mrs. Bonomack votes aye. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden votes aye. Mr. Terry. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers votes aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick votes aye. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy votes aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Mrs. Blackburn. Mrs. Blackburn votes aye. Mr. Bilbray. Mr. Bilbray votes aye. Mr. Bass. Mr. Bass votes aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise votes aye. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes aye. Mrs. McMorris Rogers. Mr. Harper. Mr. Harper votes aye. Mr. Lance. Mr. Lance votes aye. Mr. Cassidy. Mr. Cassidy votes aye. Mr. Guthrie. Mr. Guthrie votes aye. Mr. Olson. Mr. Olson votes aye. Mr. McKinley. Mr. McKinley votes aye. Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner votes aye. Mr. Pompeo. Mr. Pompeo votes aye. Mr. Kinzinger. Mr. Kinzinger votes aye. Mr. Griffith. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle votes no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Towns. Mr. Towns votes no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo votes no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel votes no. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Ms. DeGette. Ms. DeGette votes no. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps votes no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle votes no. Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky votes no. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez votes no. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee votes no. Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Ross. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson votes aye. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Barrow. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen votes no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes no. Chairman Upton. Votes aye. Chairman Upton votes aye. Mr. Terry. Aye. Mr. Terry votes aye. Are there... Mr. Griffith. Aye. Mr. Griffith votes aye. Are there other members wishing to cast a vote? Seeing none, the clerk will report the tally. How is, is Mr. Barrow? Yeah. Mr. Barrow is not recorded. Mr. Barrow votes aye. Wait. 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 Uh, How is the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, recorded? Mr. Rush is not recorded. Mr. Rush votes no. Mr. Sullivan? Mr. Sullivan votes aye. Are there other members? Clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 31 ayes, 16 nays. 31 ayes, 16 nays. The bill is, uh, the ayes have it, and the bill is favorably recorded. At this point, the chair would call up H.R. 3310. Mr. Chairman, I seek recognition. Uh, from how much time will we have to file a proper denunciation? This all all this bills will have the proper time. There's I'm one sorry? more bill to go. All, all three bills will have the proper time to file the minority views. Uh, could I be informed what that is? Sometime it changes. No, I think it's always three days. Three days. Three days. Thank you. 
Uh, at this point, the chair will call up H.R. 3310 and ask the clerk to report. H.R. 3310, as amended by the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology on November 16th, 2011. And without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with, so ordered. Are there any bipartisan amendments to the bill? The gentlelady from California, Ms. Eshoo, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. It's labeled uh, EJS. What's the number? Do you have the number, Sean? Four? Two. Two. To the, the clerk will report the title of the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 3310, as amended, offered by Ms. Eshoo of California. And the clerk will be considered as read. The staff will distribute the amendment, and the gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, at the subcommittee markup, I, I offered an amendment uh, to ensure that the FCC continues to have the flexibility to evaluate all forms of competition. With the growing convergence of communications and media platforms, I'm introducing a revised amendment today to ensure that when assessing the state of competition, the FCC can consider all forms of competition, including examining particular segments or sectors of the communications marketplace. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I understand that you've agreed to accept my amendment. I thank you for being willing to include this small but important change. And with the adoption of the amendment, I will support this bill today. Yield back. Thank the gentlelady. I'm delighted to support her amendment. And uh, are there any other people seeking recognition on this amendment? Is there any objection to this amendment? All those in favor will say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The question now occurs on favorably reporting the bill as amended to the House. All those in favor will say aye. Those opposed, no. All those favoring the bill will say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. <laughs> See, the same outcome. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. The bill is favorably reported. Without objection, the staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes to the bills approved by the committee today. The chair thanks all members and staff. Without objection, the committee now stands adjourned.